but uh, welcome everyone for tonight's uh, webinar on pain featuring Dr. Berberian from New Jersey and uh, two special panelists and uh, patients of his as well. We have Dakota Riley awesome. and Melissa Amalfitano. Hi. I guess we will get started. So my name is Estella Lugo, if, for those of you I have not met yet, and I am with the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation. And this is part of our CMT Connect webinar series. And um, I think it's pretty clear to many of us in the CMT community that pain is a major, major issue. In fact, um, in a recent study we did, pain was the number one um, challenge that CMT patients face. So re we really, you know, we, we, want, we want our community to thrive. We want to provide everyone with as many resources um, and communication with experts as possible. So we decided to uh, develop a series, a webinar series. We know it's a big topic and we're not going to be able to answer uh, everyone's questions in one webinar. So we really want to break it down into different portions. And tonight is going to be focused on surgery. We're going to have a few future webinars based on medication, based on uh, holistic uh, treatments. So we want to provide the full gamut of available treatments out there to help manage your pain. So without further ado, tonight we have a very special guest, one of our favorite orthopedic surgeons, Dr. Wayne Babarian with um, uh, Ankle and Foot Institute in New Jersey. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about, before we get started, I know we have a, a great presentation. Um, tell us a little bit about what your experience so far has been like treating CMT patients and what their main concern is a lot of the time when they're, when they're coming to see you. Well, I, you know, I, I have uh, quite a bit of experience treating difficult cases because uh, for about 20 years, I was at Rutgers. I was a professor at Rutgers in Newark and uh, it's a tertiary care hospital there. And so uh, we had some of the hardest cases referred to us. And uh, you know, what I noticed is pe many times people will divide pain and deformity when, when you see patients with Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. And what I found is in terms of the type of pain that I treat, which is the musculoskeletal pain, Many times the two are really linked together and actually deformity is the driver of pain. Right, and that's what we wanna kind of clarify tonight. A lot of people are experiencing pain right now or they might in the future and maybe they're scared to go to a doctor because they don't wanna to be told that they have to have a life-changing surgery that's gonna disrupt everything. Um, and they're not sure whether or not it's just something that could be fixed with bracing or so forth. So tonight, your presentation is really gonna help us kind of clarify um, you know, what pain can be corrected with and without surgery, when you should consider surgery, um, and, and all the steps there in between. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen tonight. And like I said, uh, please feel free to ask your questions. I'm gonna be hearing from Dakota, um, who is a patient of Dr. Babarian. So she had a surgery uh, about a year or so ago. And uh, my sister, Melissa Malfitano, uh, who's also a patient of Dr. Babarian. So they're gonna be kind of sharing their experiences as well to help uh, shed some perspective there. All right, so I'm gonna be sharing my presentation here, Dr. Babarian's presentation. Thank you. All right. So yeah, walk us through. Okay, we can, uh, we can go on to the next slide. So first of all, um, I'm gonna be presenting uh, some of this material in terms of medical terms. And I don't want anybody to get intimidated by that. Uh, the reason I do that is because when you're in a different forum, you should know what some of these terms mean so that you'll understand when someone else may be speaking about it or you may be reading an article that, uh, that uses these terms. But I'm gonna explain what everything means. So first of all, 
on a basic level, musculoskeletal pain uh, originates from muscles, bones, ligaments, and tendons. And in some uh, textbooks, you might read that it also, nerve pain is musculoskeletal pain. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna divide nerve pain from these, and I'm gonna call that neurogenic pain. And we're not gonna talk about that very much tonight because um, you know, that's something that the neurologist can teach you about a lot better. There are other, there are other treatments uh, for nerve pain that are not related to what I do. So we're gonna talk about this other type of pain, musculoskeletal pain. And as I said before, the pain is really closely linked to deformity. So as we go through the talk, you might be saying, why is he talking so much about deformity? This is supposed to be a lecture on pain. But I'm going to explain to you why the pain is occurring in most cases because of the deformity that is occurring. Right. And just because you have deformity doesn't mean that you need to have surgery. Uh, it can be treated very effectively non-surgically. I know, I know patients who are uh, you know, quite old with this disease and, and they haven't had a surgery. They have maybe a milder form. And then of course, I know young patients who, who have had to go on and have surgery at a, at a young age. And so I think we can say that it's not really related to your age, it's related to that specific clinical presentation that you have with the Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so how common is deformity? Well, you know, they don't have a, a, an exact handle on this, but there is a statistic that for, for CMT1, which is a significant portion of CMT patients, uh, up to two thirds of these patients develop a cavus deformity. And cavus means high arch. A good way to remember it is that when you're looking at the foot from the side, it almost looks like you might have a cave under your foot because there's that kind of that curving shape to it that you can see. And you can see that the arch decreases a little bit when the patient stands, okay? This is the same patient, but the arch looks deeper on the upper, upper left where, you know, they're not, they're just hanging their foot down. And once they step on it, you'll see that it'll, it'll drop a bit, but it's still quite a high arch. Um, now, not every CMT patient presents with a high arch. I have very rarely a CMT patient come in, a documented uh, CMT patient who's had genetic testing and they have a horrible flat foot deformity. And uh, you know, it almost baffles me a little bit when I see that because, because you say, what was the evolution of this when most patients have, have this other deformity with the high arch, but uh, that's the usual. So we can go on. Okay. So another, so, so part of this deformity, okay, usually people will not get one type or another type or another type. They'll get kind of a mix of these different types of deformity and they'll be in, in varying proportions. But one of the things that happens is that your, the bone behind your great toe, your first metatarsal, will, will be pulled down. And I'll show you more about that later. And so the bottom of your foot will be in the front of the foot, will be turned away from the midline of your body, so towards the side of your body. And that's called valgus. Anything in orthopedics where there's a deformity and it points away from the midline of your body is valgus. And a deformity that points towards the mid, midline of your body, if you were to draw a line straight down your nose and through your belly button and down, down to the floor, that's the midline of your body. If something is pointing towards that, then it's called varus. So varus and valgus. Well, you get this valgus forefoot. And so the front of the foot behind the toes is, is twisted so that the sole is angling away from the midline of the body. And what that does, okay, people won't walk like that. They won't walk just on one little point under the bottom of their foot because that's what they'd be doing if they put their, if they just kind of put their foot down and their foot was twisted that way. So 
what they tend to do is twist the back of their foot the opposite way mm. so that their foot can sit flat on the ground. And so go on to the next slide and you'll see this same patient, you see how the back of her foot looks, the heel right. is embarrassed. So it's the opposite. It's like two opposite parts. The, the front is going one way. And so that kind of drives the back into going the other way. Um, and so when your heel is rotated in towards the middle on your body, not all the time, I would say even not most of the time, but occasionally, like in this patient, you're putting so much tension on the outside of the ankle that you can get an unstable ankle because the ligaments can, can just stretch out. And that can be important in, in terms of surgical planning. If this, if this patient has surgery, then you know, they may need uh, to have those ligaments tightened up as part of the procedure. Whereas most patients who don't have that ankle ligament instability won't need that as part of the surgical procedure. Okay, go on to the next one, please. And then the other thing is that, you know, people with CMT often get claw toes. There are a lot of different disorders that cause claw toes. In fact, diabetes causes claw toes. But one thing that I always notice when I see CMT patients that make them differ from people with diabetes or other, other reasons for claw toes is that those patients usually only get that curving of the toes in the lesser toes, but not in the great toe or what you might call the big toe. Whereas in CMT, they also have different reasons. And, and one of the reasons is because when you have weakness in lifting your foot up with a certain tendon called the tibialis anterior, you then try to lift it with some of the other tendons, including the tendons that pull up your toes. And then because you're always over pulling with those tendons that pull up your toes, your mm -hmm. toes start to, you know, your toes start to come up. So diabetics get claw toes for a different reason, and they usually it usually doesn't affect the great toe. Okay, let's go on. So how does deformity occur? Well, it's it's caused by an imbalance between two or more muscles. So if you go to the supermarket and you buy a flank steak, that red piece of meat, that's a cow's muscle, which incidentally looks very similar to what a human muscle looks like in surgeries. And you might notice if you look carefully at the steak that there's these little white strings coming off the end of it. Some people call those sinews, that's the old name, but what we call them today is tendons. So they usually cut that tendon off so you'll only see a little short piece of it, but that tendon can be quite long, and the other end of the tendon plugs into a bone. And what happens is the muscle, your brain says, I wanna contract that, that muscle, I wanna move this bone. Then it sends a nerve impulse down your spinal cord, down a peripheral nerve to the muscle. The muscle fires and contracts, shortens, pulling on that white rope, that tendon, which in turn, is connected on the other side to the bone and it moves the bone. So we're really almost like marionette puppets, all of us, in, in moving except that our brain is the puppeteer. And what happens many times is that, especially in the lower extremity, that the position of a bone is hanging in neutral between two tendons pulling in opposite directions. And the bone kind of stays put where it should because you have a, a, a tendon pulling on one side and on the opposite side, you have a tendon pulling with equal force. And so the bone's just hanging there, okay? So it's almost like a tug of war and the ribbon, which is the bone, is balanced in the center. So you can go on. So now when CMT comes along and affects with CMT1, it slows nerve conduction velocities, or with CMT2, 
it weakens the nerve impulses, then because the muscle is not getting that input that it needs from the nerve in order to function properly, the muscle starts to get weak. But maybe the muscle that's its antagonist on the other side of the bone is not weak. Maybe that's maintaining most or all of its strength. And so what happens is the strong muscle starts to overpower the weakened muscle and the weakened muscle loses the tug of war and the bone goes towards the stronger muscle and it can actually get contracted in that position. And that, that's what we call a deformity. So for example, I'll, get, I'll give you one example of this. This is, you know, like I said, probably the most common deformity that we see is this cavus foot deformity where you have that high arch. And so you have one muscle plugging in on the base of the first metatarsal. It's on the top of the metatarsal. It's called the tibialis anterior. And that one is notorious in CMT for getting weak pretty early. Whereas another muscle that plugs in on the bottom of the bone often stays strong until later in the disease. And that's called the peroneus longus. So the first metatarsal is being held between these two bones, but then the one on the top gets weak. The one on the bottom is still pulling almost as strong as it was. And the bone gets pulled down and you end up getting that high arch. And that's probably, you know, one of them, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons why you get a high arch. We can go on. And this is just a, a picture without all the arrows. So you can really imagine how that happens. Okay. So in CMT, how does deformity relate to pain? What are the causes of this musculoskeletal or orthopedic pain in the foot? And, and non-operatively, without surgery, what would be the goals of trying to treat this? So one cause is that when you get a deformity where a bone is, is deviated in a certain direction, that often causes a, a bony prominence, okay? Either on the top of the foot or on the bottom of the foot. And that can cause increased pressure or friction under that bony prominence, and that can lead to pain. And under that, I've put, I've, I've put a little uh, kind of uh, very important tenet of orthopedics. It's a, it's a concept that relates to many things in orthopedics and even in engineering and physics. And that concept is the less contact surface area you have. If you have two surfaces, two flat surfaces, let's say, that are touching each other, the less area where they're touching, the less area where they're in contact, the greater the pressures between them. So let's think about it this way. If I put my hand on a table, and I put a book on top of it, and I take a hammer, and I hit it with five newtons of force on the book, I'm probably not gonna, it's probably not gonna hurt me that much because the pressure is spread out over my entire hand. But if you were to take a railroad spike and hit it with that same five newtons of force on my hand, you know, I, I wouldn't be too happy. So, so that's kind of the, that's, how arthritis often can form in joints is that there's less contact between two joints and, and that small area there is then getting a lot of pressure. It's getting all the pressure put on it and the cartilage wears out. Uh, and it's also a way that you can get pain on the bottom of your foot because instead of the ground touching the entire bottom of your foot, when you have that very high arch foot, you have a lot of space under the foot that is not in contact with the ground. And so those, those few areas that, those few small areas that are in contact with the ground get a lot of increased pressure. And we all know that if you put increased pressure on your skin or on anything, it's gonna to start to hurt. So the goals of treatment would be, we can pad those bony prominences to decrease that friction or that pressure. And now I'm gonna introduce you to two more terms, 
reducible or irreducible. Reducible means when you have a deformity, but if I take my hand, let's say you come to see me in the office, you have this deformity, I take my hand and I try to correct it with my hand and it goes back to where it should, that's a reducible deformity. So if I can do that with my hand, maybe we can use a shoe or an insole or, some, or a brace or something of that nature to change that alignment and make the bone go back to where it's supposed to be. And then there's an irreducible deformity. Irreducible deformity, the best way I could explain it is, you know, when I was a kid, if I made a, a, a face, my mother would say to me, if you keep making that face, it's gonna stick like that. And that's kind of what happens with the foot. The, the foot sits in that position for so long that it contracts into that position and then it kind of gets stuck. And then if I was seeing you in the office and I tried to, to bend that foot back to the way it should, it might not move or it might only move a little bit. And then that would be either an irreducible deformity or a partially reducible deformity. So if you have an irreducible deformity, you can't get a brace or an insole to bend the foot back to where it should be. But what you can do is you can fill in those spaces on the bottom. Like for example, that high arch, all that space under the high arch. What if you had a brace or an insole that filled in all that space so that you were actually bearing weight through that high arch? And then that would increase that surface area, that contact surface area that we were talking about. And then the peak pressures would decrease because you have more surface in contact with the ground. Okay, we can go on. So how do we accomplish these particular goals? Well, we can get you some, some shoe modifications to accommodate that deformity. And I'm not necessarily talking about anything special like custom molded shoes, uh, which are a real pain, but you know, maybe something as simple as, as changing the sneaker or shoe that you're wearing to a different shape. You know, shoe companies use something called lasts, which are like uh, wooden or plastic models of feet to create the shapes of their shoes. And maybe you're using a last that doesn't, that doesn't match the shape of your foot as much. And if you find a shoe that was made off of a last that does mimic the shape of your foot, maybe you're more comfortable in that because nothing is really pushing or scraping on your foot. Um, and then in addition, uh, you know, there are these custom molded cushioned insoles. So, you know, for patients without CMT who come in, I very rarely would, would uh, prescribe a, a, a custom molded cushioned insole. I'd probably prescribe them if I was prescribing an insole, an off the shelf in, insole, but I think for someone with CMT who has a significant deformity, uh, it would be the right thing to do. And you can see that in, in this case, you can make the lateral side of the shoe, the, the part of the shoe more away from your great toe towards the outside edge of your foot, you can make that higher and that can help to tip the foot in if you have a reducible deformity and correct the foot. Whereas with an irreducible deformity, you can mold it and you can see that the arch here is molded pretty high on the right side to fill in that area and give you more contact with the ground. Okay. So here's another cause, okay? Here's another three causes. Deformity leads to tension on ligaments. Remember that uh, patient who had her, her heel tipped in and I said she could get ligament instability, she had ligament instability. Well, they, well they, they don't have to just have ligament instability, they could have ligament pain because those ligaments are being stretched co constantly. It's almost like chronically spraining your ankle. And then another way that deformity can hurt is that it can lead to abnormal loading of joint surfaces. We touched on that before. And that causes wearing out of your cartilage, which the definition for that is arthritis and arthritis hurts. And then finally, uh, I think a lot of CMT patients have experienced 
falling because they have trouble walking. In fact, I've had a lot of patients show up in my office and that's kind of what made them see me was that they said, I, I, I feel like I can't walk anymore without falling down. I fractured my wrist, I fractured my ankle. And you know, that's, that's one of the major drivers, I think, when you have more of a severe deformity, maybe with weakness. And uh, so that's certainly painful. So the goals would be to, if you have an unstable joint, you could stabilize it, right? To reduce tension on those ligaments and soft tissue structures. If you have an arthritic joint, you could stabilize it so it doesn't move as much non-surgically. There's also a surgical way to do it, but I'm talking non-surgically. And you could also, if you're, if you're someone with a foot drop, okay, and you're tripping all the time and, and falling down, you could hold the foot in a better position so that your gait would improve and then maybe you don't fall as much. Okay, we can go on. So how are these goals accomplished? Well, really bracing is, is a great way to accomplish this. It doesn't work for everybody. Some people are severe to the point where they need surgery. That's certainly true, but bracing can help a lot of people and sometimes it can put surgery off. So um, there are three types of braces that I'm talking about here and they're all in the category of custom molded, what we call ankle foot orthoses or AFO. And so the first one is what we call a posterior leaf spring AFO. And that's kind of a bit more flexible. It allows you to get a little spring in your step. It's really good for people with a foot drop, okay? If you have, um, you know, instability, or if you have sometimes a significant deformity or weakness, uh, in multiple planes, if you have arthritis, then that's not really appropriate. And then you want some, the second one, which is a rigid or fixed ankle foot orthosis that does not bend as much. And then lastly, you know, some people with CMT will also have trouble supporting their knee. And if you're in that situation, you could get what's called the ground reaction, or sometimes they call it a floor reaction AFO. And, and that has a little strut that curves around at the top where that tan area is in front of your leg. And so what it does is that as you're putting weight through the brace, that little bar or strut is pushing back on your leg, straightening your knee and supporting it. Okay, we can move on. So finally, the last set of causes here is, and these are the easy ones. When I see this, you know, you, th this is, an, is more of an easy fix. An, an ill-fitting or old brace, or maybe the wrong type of brace, can create areas of pressure or friction on bony prominences. And, and if that's the case, you could just replace that brace. You know, you could get a new one or a different type or, or even take the old one if it's still in pretty good shape and just needs some, uh, some modifications, you could, you could modify it. Um, and then the other thing is that when, when you have areas of pressure or friction, your skin reacts by creating corns and calluses. And, and those are just thickenings uh, in the skin. It's caused by something called keratin. And, and, you, and, and those corns and calluses in themselves can also be painful. So in addition to whatever bone is putting pressure under the area and causing the formation of that corn, the corn itself hurts enough, but that's, that's not a hard thing to deal with. The corn itself can be debrided in the office. It can be very carefully taken down until it's really thinned out and it doesn't hurt as much. Now, if you don't do something about the underlying area of pressure that's causing it, then it will grow back. But I do have people who come in periodically, they don't wanna have surgery, but you know they do get pain as this thing gets thicker and thicker. And we try to relieve the pressure in other ways. And in addition, 
we go ahead and shave those down so that they don't hurt as much. Okay. We can go on. So here you can see an example of a, it, it's kind of beneath the fourth and fifth toes there. There's a kind of a big callus there. And uh, you know, this is a patient that I, that I trim that down. And the other thing is that, you know, we look to see, are the deformities progressing? Why is this patient getting a callus or a corn in an area that, that they didn't have one before? Why are they having trouble in an area that wasn't bothering them before? Is the deformity increasing or does the brace need to be changed? It, it can almost give us a clue about what the next step is, okay? So what can bracing do? Well, and what can it do? Well, it can accommodate the deformity. In other words, if you have a deformity, it can enclose it, it can protect it. Sometimes it can take some of the pressure off of it. Um, it can also stabilize uh, a joint if it's unstable or has arthritis. You can protect a foot with a loss of sensation so that you don't get an ulcer. And you know, not everybody has a significant loss of sensation with CMT, but you, I've certainly seen patients who, who can't feel almost at all when they have CMT. And it can control that foot drop so that you're not tripping over your feet when you're walking, okay? And it, it, what can it do, it, it can't restore strength. Okay, no insole or brace is going to give you back the strength in a muscle where you've lost it. And if you have a rigid deformity or what we call an, an irreducible deformity, it cannot correct that deformity. If I can't correct it with my hand, a brace is not gonna correct it. Um, maybe it can slow down the progression of a deformity but we don't have scientific evidence for that. That's just us using our heads and saying it kind of makes sense. Okay. So what are the goals of surgical treatment of, of CMT? Well, there's a term that you'll see, plant the grade foot. Plant the grade foot is just a foot that kind of goes flat on the ground. It may not be completely flat on the ground, but it's a foot that you can walk on. And it's, it's a foot that sits well on the ground so that you can get around. So if you don't have a plant the grade foot, you can give somebody a plant the grade foot by improving bony deformity with surgery. If your soft tissues are contracted, remember I said, if you make that face, then it may stay like that. Well. If, if your foot is contracted, because after years of, of your foot sitting in a certain deformed position, the soft tissues have shrunk and it's now locked into that position. Well, we can't, we, I, I said a minute ago, we can't correct that with bracing, but we can correct it with surgery, right? Because we're opening the foot up, the soft tissues are right there and we can release those soft tissues and we can correct that and stretch it out. Um, and then also we can rebalance those muscles. Remember the tug of war that I told you about before? Well, how about if somebody comes in to help the side that's losing? Well, we can do that by taking another strong tendon that may be deforming one area of the foot and we can transfer it around to another area to help a weak tendon balance out. With, with a tendon that's going against it. So that's called tendon transfers, okay? We can straighten toes. Sometimes when we straighten toes, we need to fuse them so that they don't move anymore, but we can do it. And, you know, toes are not fingers. You don't, generally, you don't play piano with your toes. I, I guess some people do, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how to do that. So. Most people are comfortable if their toes are straight and may not be comfortable if they're really deformed or curved. Um, and then if a, if a joint has very bad arthritis, we can fuse it together. It's true that it won't move anymore if we fuse the joint together. But oftentimes when someone has a very arthritic joint, 
it doesn't move too well anyway. So you're not losing that much. You're, you're getting rid of pain, you're correcting deformity, and you're really not losing much motion because there may have been very little motion or sometimes no motion there to begin with. And you're just putting it in a better position. And if you have a hypermobile joint or an unstable joint, you can stabilize it in surgery. Okay. So people say, well, what type of surgery would you do on a charcot marie tooth disease patient? And the real answer is you can't, you can't reliably respond like that because there's no one size fits all. Every patient, that's what makes CMT patients so complex and, and really sometimes I, I would say that CMT patients cause me to put my thinking cap on more than almost any other type of disorder that I see in my office because each patient is completely different each patient has weakness in different areas, different deformities, um, you know, different areas of pain. And we have to put together a combination of procedures. And these are tested procedures that we know, you know, they work, but they don't work in everybody. So what we do is we get kind of this combination of procedures that is applicable to that one particular patient. And in order to know which procedures are gonna be the most applicable to that patient, it's very important to get a detailed history, to find out the exact locations of where the patient hurts, do a very careful physical exam, maybe multiple times. Sometimes I'll bring a patient in three times to see him before I'll do a surgery because, you know, maybe one day you had one impression and then you bring them back and you check it over again and you say, wait, my impression is a little bit different here. And you wanna make sure before you go in and do this that you're doing it right. Um, and then, you know, you also wanna look at imaging studies. X-rays are always critical before you do a surgery on a, on a CMT patient. And sometimes we get, uh, you know, CT scans or MRIs as well, okay? So, just general procedures. I'm not going to go into all the little specifics because, you know, we'd be here for a long time, but general procedures that can be used include releasing those tight contracted structures that are holding the foot in a deformed position, tendon transfers, which is moving the tendon of a strong muscle into a position where it substitutes for a weak or non-functional muscle. And you may say, well, how do you hold it to the bone when you move it? There's many different ways. There's anchors, there's screws. I, I typically use something called an interference screw, which is where we drill a little socket into the bone. We pull the end of the tendon into that little socket, and then you put in a little screw that's made out of a, a composite material. It's, not, it's like a ceramic screw. It's not generally metal. And, and when you put it into that hole with the end of the tendon, it kind of crushes that, the end of that tendon against the edge of the hole and holds it in very tightly. And then your body starts scarring it in over time and, uh, and it gets firmly attached. And then osteotomies is another procedure where we cut bones, we reshape them, we change the angles of them. And then you can't just do that and kind of walk away and let it flop back to its old position so that's why we put metal hardware in. So we put plates, we put screws, we put pins, and it holds, holds those bones into the position that we want while everything heals together. Okay. And then we talked a little bit about fusing a joint. So when you fuse a joint, you can lock those two adjacent bones together so they don't move anymore. The way we do that is we go in with a little sharpened spoon called a curette and other instruments and, and we, you're asleep, so don't get too worried, but we go in there, we scrape out the joint, we scrape out any remaining cartilage. And then when we're down to nice, healthy bleeding bone, we put the two surfaces together in the optimum position. And then we put some metal hardware across to hold it together. 
Often we use something called bone graft, which can be gotten either from a bone bank or from the patient. And that helps things heal together properly. And you wait for the two bones to grow into one bone. And then it's, like I said before, it won't move anymore across that joint, but it's really a godsend for some patients. It, they, you know, they feel so much better um, if it's the right patient. You don't want to fuse unless it's absolutely necessary because we like to preserve motion. We correct toe deformities and there are a few different ways to do that. And lastly, like I said, I, I find it's pretty rare, but you may need an ankle ligament reconstruction. One thing I want to point out is that that angle there is called Miri's angle. When we look at that from the side, that red line, and it's supposed to be a straight line. It should be zero. So you can see how that muscular imbalance has really pulled that metatarsal down, creating that cavus foot. And there's a, there's a 23 degree angle there instead of a zero degree angle. Okay. So we take into account surgical considerations. What's the motor strength of each muscle? What deformities are present? And are they reducible or irreducible? Is the person insensate? Do they have any feeling? What other kind of comorbidities do they have? I've operated on CMT patients who have diabetes, who have all other kinds of morbidities. Okay. And then the surgical plan, we customize it, like I said. So here's just, I'm going to finish up now, but this is an example of a patient that I operated on. This patient had very weak dorsiflexors of her ankle. In other words, she had trouble picking up her foot. She had a foot drop. When she walked, her foot was hanging down. That is a difficult problem to deal with. Um, she also had contracture of something called the plantar fascia on the bottom of the foot. You've probably heard of plantar fasciitis and that structure, the plantar fascia, is a band on the bottom of the foot. And when your foot develops that cavus deformity, it can really get contracted and, and, and shortened, and that has to be released. And she had a partially reducible cavus deformity with, remember, cavus is the high arch, and also a varus deformity. Remember, varus is when it points towards the midline of your body, and valgus is when it points away. And she did have good sensation. Okay. So we released her plantar fascia and I released other soft tissues. I cut her heel bone. I took a wedge out of it. That's called a Dwyer osteotomy. And then when I took that wedge out, I was able to close that wedge shaped space down and straighten the bone out. And I put a screw across it you can see in her heel to hold that in place. It healed up nicely, which it usually does. It's a big surface area. And then I did the same thing on her metatarsals. A lot of times you just have to do one metatarsal, sometimes two, the most I've ever had to do was three. And um, so you take that wedge out and then there's a wedge shaped space left behind. Then you close that space down and you straighten the metatarsal. And again, I put a, a plate this time on the top of the foot with screws and I fused together with that screw in her toe. I fused together her toe. Uh, the great toe is called the hallux. So this is the hallux interphalangeal joint or IP joint, that little, that little end joint in your toe. And I did a lot of tendon transfers on her to move things around and rebalance the muscles. Okay. So afterwards, she had a pretty good result. Still has weakness in terms of picking her foot up and pushing it down and off to the side. She really had no, no muscular input at all, but the position of the foot is, is much improved. And I think, I think she's, very much improved in terms of how she was walking. Okay. So the conclusion, just we know now after looking at this, that the pain, if you're talking about orthopedic pain, not nerve pain, but orthopedic pain, 
It's, it's linked to that deformity. And that pain can be treated non-operatively in many cases, or sometimes surgically. And uh, we know that we have to customize these treatment plans, whether it's non-operative treatment or surgical treatment for every patient. Every patient is different and is an individual and has individual areas of pain. They have individuals of in, individual needs in their personal life in terms of what they can do and can't do at a certain time in their life. And you have to look at each patient, you know, separately and decide what the best plan is for them. Okay. So thank you so much. Be, I don't want anyone to leave yet because we are going to be uh, going to our panelists now. But for anyone who wants to take a screenshot or a photo uh, of Dr. Barbarian's contact information, I'm just going to put the screen up here for a few seconds. And then I'm going to stop the share and we're just going to speak with our two panelists. Um, we're going to start with Melissa, who's a non-surgical patient, and then we're also going to hear from Dakota, who's a, a surgical patient. So I hope everybody got a screenshot of that. If not, um, we will be providing that afterwards. All right, so there's Melissa. So Melissa, um, tell us a little bit about what brought you to seek out uh, an evaluation from Dr. Beberi and what kind of pain you were you were experiencing? Um, well, it had been a few months where I was experiencing pain on my feet, on the sides of the feet where I couldn't walk without my braces anymore. Um, over the years, I had um, some pain, but I went to go see doctors and I was, they left there with nothing for me. Um, they would just tell me that, well, one doctor told me that my foot was just a bag of bones and it, it, was, it was just my disease and there's nothing they can do, and I left the office in tears that day. Um, I went to a podiatrist that tried to, you know, exfoliate my feet. I was soaking my feet every night, and nothing was helping. And I put it off so much because I was so scared to go to a doctor for them to tell me that I do need surgery. So I have two young kids at home. I was like, there's no way. I'm just gonna have to go with it. But I got to the point where I was crawling around my house to get around at night and my husband was carrying me. He's like, enough, you have to go to the doctor and I reached out to you, my sister. And she recommended Dr. Babirian and he um, was incredible. And now I'm walking around again and no pain. Excellent, so maybe Dr. Babirian, if you don't mind chiming in here, um, what was Melissa's um, cause of pain? How did you evaluate that? And what was the treatment like? Well, uh, her, her main issue that she was having, I think, was the fact that she has this deformity and she was putting a lot of, a lot of pressure and, and also weakness and was putting a lot of pressure on the lateral border of her, of her feet and on the outs that outside border. And, and um, it actually turned out to be kind of a simple fix in that, you know, we decided that we'd get a, a, a better brace. And so uh, we ordered a better brace for her. And uh, I think, you know, that's, that's done, the, done the trick. Right. And you also removed some of the callus that was forming as well, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, and, and I think this is important to also explain that it, it's really vital that your doctor is very specific about what your bracing needs are. A lot of times we'll get scripts just, you know, a vague uh, prescription for an AFO and, you know, the, the patient is left, you know, uh, fending for themselves, trying to figure out what AFO they should get. Or, you know, it ends up that the orthotist ends up picking out a brace. Maybe it's off the shelf. Maybe it's custom. But I think, you know, what sets you apart is that when you did see Melissa, you are very detailed in your prescription about what kind of AFO she should be getting that would help kind of alleviate the pain and prevent further deformities. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so, well, it, it really goes cheap. Her, her AFO that I ordered was a, a floor reaction or ground reaction AFO. 
because uh, Melissa also had some weakness around her knee and difficulty in stabilizing the knee when she was walking. So we wanted that extra strut there to give that backwards push on the leg and stabilize that knee. Um, and, you know, in addition, you know, you can literally look sometimes and see where a bony prominence is. And you can, you, you can specify that. I mean, these, these people who make the braces, if it's a competent person who's used to making these braces, they want as much information as you can give them. And you can say something like, unload the base of the fifth metatarsal, uh, put a recess in you know, the padding in this area or that area, and you really describe exactly how to take pressure off of these different areas. Right. So it would make sense to go to a really, you know, well-informed orthopedic surgeon for an evaluation, maybe with x-rays, because I know Melissa had x-rays taken to kind of um, clarify whether or not this could be corrected with or without the surgery. Um, is that something you would recommend? So even if you're not necessarily considering surgery, maybe go to an orthopedic surgeon who can really give you a specific um, prescription for an AFO? Yes, always x-rays, always x-rays on, on a patient with CMT. I think that's, that's just a given. You know, there are, there are a few different disorders that are not, rela not related to CMT where I'll maybe forego x-rays the first appointment. But for CMT, I would always get it the first appointment so you know upfront what you're dealing with. Yes, very, very important points. Okay. Well, thank you, Melissa. Um, I can thank now you. go to our next uh, panelist, Dakota Riley. Uh, Dakota, tell us a little bit about your experience. Yeah, so um, I was having a lot of similar pains as Dr. Bavarian talked about during this. I had high arches and the claw toes and I was putting a lot of pressure on points on my foot that the majority of my weight shouldn't have been on. So I was in a lot of pain and I tried different inserts. I tried braces and braces did help, but not as much with the pain in my feet because I still was putting pressure on those areas and the deformity kept getting worse. So after about a year of having braces, my feet didn't really fit them anymore. So at, during all this time I was in high school, so it didn't really feel like a time that I could devote to surgery. So I really was postponing it. But once I finished school, I realized that once you're in college, like it's super customizable to have your schedule be one day a week or whatever. So I figured it was the perfect time. And we met with Dr. Bavarian and he just explained everything that he could do surgically super thoroughly. And it just made sense. It sounded like it would work and it really did. So yeah, Dr. Bavarian, would you mind shedding a little bit more light on, on Dakota's case? Yeah, uh, well, Dakota had, you know, quite a, a, a bad deformity and, and uh, was really having trouble walking. I mean, uh, I remember when I evaluated her gait in the office, just walking down the hall, I, I was afraid she was gonna fall down and hurt herself. It, it, uh, it was to that level. And so uh, I think it was four surgeries that I did on her. We planned out four surgeries uh, because I mean, uh, she got pretty much the deluxe version of the surgery. It was. Uh, the whole nine yards, you know, I had to really uh, do a lot of osteotomies and, and different tendon transfers and so forth. I thought it would be too much to do um, all that on each, on each foot in a single surgery. So we broke it up into uh, the back of her foot and then the front of her foot and then the back of the other one and the front of the other one. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think she was doing much better. Yeah, Dakota, so how do you feel now versus pre-surgery? And, and maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what that um, rehab process was like, because I think a lot of patients are very, um, you know, intimidated by the, the rehabilitation portion and, and what that looks like. Yeah, definitely. I mean, overall, it was definitely worth it. My arches were much more flatter, my toes were straighter, and I was much more balanced on my feet because now the pressure was everywhere that it should be. Um, my gait improved, everything. Like I was wearing braces before surgery and I didn't need them afterwards. So that was just an amazing like That's solution. Amazing. So it was great. But um, 
the whole experience itself, it's definitely a lot. I had the first two surgeries on the left foot, like about three weeks apart. And then as soon as I was able to start putting pressure on the 